whether you're in Europe, America, or Australia. There's a lot of talk these days about migration. Now, of course, if you're going to talk about Islam and migration, you'd have to know before you even look into it that Islam will have its own unique take on migration. And indeed it does. There's even a doctrine of migration, the Hijra. Now, to know how important this Hijra is, we need to start off with a graph here of Muhammad's career. You'll notice it has two distinct parts. He was a preacher of Islam for 13 years in Mecca and converted 150 Arabs. That's about 10 a year. But he created a lot of division and argument within the community, and so the Meccans told him he had to leave. And this was the first migration. He migrated to Medina, whereupon Muhammad became a very different kind of man. He was not just a religious preacher anymore, but he was a politician and a jihadist. Now, his jihad brought him success. There were 100 events of jihad in the last nine years of his life, and when he died, every Arab in his neighborhood of the Hijaz was a Muslim. So we see that the migration from Mecca to Medina was the beginning of political success, and this is the reason that the Islamic calendar begins with the Hijra. So why do they begin then? Because that's what brought success. Now, if you think about it, you might have thought, well, the Islamic calendar would begin when Muhammad had his first revelation, or maybe even upon the birth of Muhammad. But no, the Islamic calendar starts with the migration, the Hijra, because it was successful. Now, here's another thing to know. This was done by Muhammad, so therefore it is the Sunnah, the S-U-N-N-A, it is the perfect pattern of the perfect life. So therefore other Muslims are called upon to migrate as well. Why? For the growth of Islam. In order to see how the Hijra works after Muhammad died, I put together a battle map that included 548 battles. Now then, I'm going to not just list off to you the 548 battles, but I created a concept which I call a dynamic battle map. It's in 20-year pulses, and the new battles are in white, as you can see in this slide. When they become history, they've changed to red. Now let's watch it unfold. Immediately after Muhammad's death, Islam exploded out of the Arabian Peninsula into the rest of the Middle East. They quickly spread, taking North Africa and all of the Middle East and begin to spread even into Persia. Now, when you think of Islam, you probably think of deserts, particularly Muhammad, but we can see here that Islam created a naval force and was able to project power across the Mediterranean. Immediately, they started attacking Spain, and you can see their success not only in Spain, but pressing into the areas of the East where Zoroasterism, Buddhism, and Hinduism were. Now with these battles, we have slave taking. As a matter of fact, there's going to be a million slaves taken out of the Christian world and Europe in order to be put into the hands of the Caliph. He had a standing work order that virgin Christian Blondes were to be taken from Spain each year to be delivered to Baghdad. You can see also that they started attacking immediately the Byzantine Empire, which is in what we call Turkey today. They will get as far up into Europe as the gates of Vienna. And of course, there's constant war in the Balkans. Now, as you can see now, they've been driven out of Spain. You know, they say the Spanish occupation by Islam was a golden age, but why would the Spaniards fight for 700 years and over 200 battles if it was such a golden year they wanted to take care of? Now then, Islam is spread into Eastern Europe, and notice how much of Africa it's taken. We're now in the phrase where the, there's little white dots which represent battles that were fought by the U.S. Navy in their seven frigates. This is where the phrase from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli took place in the Marine Battle Hymn. And there we have it. This was the second jihad. Now we have to ask a question, what happens after Islam enters a civilization? Because after all, this is not the first time that we've had expansion of a military power. I've got a graph for you to read which consists of two parts. The blue line is the rise of Islam, and the yellow line is the fall of Christianity. This is in Turkey, and this is how Islam grew. Notice that it took centuries, but also notice something else. In the end, Christianity is annihilated, 
and Islam becomes 100%. This is what I call the law of Islamic saturation. Let's break this apart. This is the same graph except we're just looking at Islam. And you can see that in the end it becomes 100% Islamic and that's what I call saturation. Now in the very beginning of Islam's invasion, the Sharia is introduced. And believe it or not, the Sharia is being introduced into both Europe and America today. Here's what happens to the annihilation of the native civilization. You can see that there's struggle, but in the end, the native civilization collapses. Now, annihilation is the pattern, annihilation of the native civilization. We see this in Turkey, North Africa, Egypt, Iraq, Syria. These all used to be Christian. Afghanistan used to be Buddhist. Pakistan used to be Hindu. Malaysia used to be Hindu. They are all Islamic now. Why is this? Well, because of the doctrine of Islam. Now, we're going to have to take a sidebar here often to explain what the doctrine of Islam is in order to explain the annihilation effect. An objective study of Islam is based upon the Quran and Muhammad because the Quran tells us in 91 verses that every Muslim is to obey, not obey, but to follow the pattern, the Sunnah of Muhammad. And where do we find this? We find it in his Sirah, the biography, and the Hadith, his traditions. Let's talk a wee bit about the Quran. There are two Qurans, and do not go down to the bookstore and say you want either the Meccan Quran or the Medinan Quran because they're all sold in the same cover. It's just that out of the different chapters, some are written in Mecca, some are written in Medina. The reason to know this is, is that we're going to discover that these are two very, very different books. Here's how different they are. We have in the Meccan Quran, you have your religion and I have mine. Another verse is, let there be no compulsion in religion. That sounds good. But there are other verses which come later. From Medina, I shall cast terror into the hearts of the Kafirs, strike off their heads, strike off the very tips of their fingers. Now we can see my three copies of the books, Hadith, Sirah, and Quran. Now when you're looking at these, one of the things for you to notice is, you know, the Quran looks kind of small in comparison to the other two books. Now I want to emphasize a point here. On the one side, we have the Quran, the Sirah, the Hadith. These are three texts, or three books. In the other, we have a picture of a woman in a full Islamic garb. Now then, here is my point. I do not discuss Muslims. I only discuss these three books. The three books is what I talk about. I don't talk about Muslims. And by the way, I have some advice for you. Do the same. The only Muslim you want to talk about is Muhammad. Let's make a little pie chart of this. Now let's see how these three books are in terms of size. The Quran looks small, and indeed it is small in comparison to Muhammad. The Quran is only 14% of the total textual doctrine. So this means we have this much Muhammad and this much Allah. That is, it's more important to study Muhammad than it is to study Allah. Now this is a piece of good news, because the Quran is famous for being difficult to read. And yet here we have a way to easily learn Islam, to study Muhammad. Now then, we have a way to define Islam. And if you think about it, probably no one has ever actually defined Islam. It's one of those words that everybody bandies about, and yet no one really knows the actual definition. Or they think, well, Islam is what's found in the Quran. But we've already seen that there's not enough in the Quran to practice Islam. So Islam is Allah and Muhammad. Or, said another way, Islam is found in the Quran, the Sirah, and the Hadith. It is a doctrine. Now then, is a doctrine It's very confusing because we seem to have two different Islams, and indeed there are two different Islams. Islam is dualistic. Why do we have peaceful Muslims and why do we have jihadists? Isn't one of those real and the other not real? Well, there are two Islams and therefore there are two kinds of Muslim. But let's look a little further into this two Islam business. Here we have something we've seen before an early Quran, you have your religion and I have mine. A latter Quran, I shall cast terror into the hearts of the Kafirs, strike off their heads, strike off the very tips of their fingers. Now then, let's look at something else that's rather odd about the Islamic doctrine. Here we see in Mecca there is no jihad, and in Medina there's 24% of it is jihad. The Sirah is 64% about jihad, the Hadith 21%. 
So the trilogy, Quran, Sirah, Hadith, nearly a third of it is devoted to the doctrine of jihad. And this jihad is a doctrine. But is Islam about jihad? Yes. Is Islam about peace? Yes. Because we have two different Qurans. Then we have Jew hatred in the trilogy. The trilogy remembers Quran, Sirah, Hadith. In Mecca, there's almost no Jew hatred. A little bit, but towards the end. In the Medinan Quran, however, 17% of it is devoted to Jew hatred. That's a lot. The Hadith has nearly 9%, and the Sirah has 12%. This gives a total trilogy content of Jew hatred of over 9%. Now, we need to contrast this with Mein Kampf, which has only 7% of its paragraphs devoted to the idea of jihad. Now, let's go explore the dualism further because we now have two Muhammads. We have the preacher Muhammad, a religious man, and then we have the politician Muhammad, who was a jihadist. So there are two different Muhammads. Let's summarize this. We have dualism. There's, is the Quran about Jew hatred? Yes. Is the Quran about loving the Jews? Yes, it is. But wait a minute. Those two contrast with each other. Which one's real? The answer is yes. Then we have the textual of devotion to jihad. In Mecca, there is no jihad. In Medina, there's a lot of jihad. So which is real? The peace or the jihad? The answer is yes. The two different Muhammads. Well, is Muhammad the preacher real or is Muhammad the jihadist real? Both. So we see here that we have two contrasting doctrines. We have two careers here. We have a jihadist career and a peaceful religion career. Which one is real? There are always two possible modes of behavior for Islam. You can have nice or you can have an oppressor. This is because of the difference in the Quran and this is because of the difference in the Hadith and the Sirah. That is, we have two possible modes of behavior. And so therefore, answering the qu question, well, which one's the real one? Isn't one an extremist and the other moderate? Isn't the extreme false and the moderate real? No, they're both equally real. Now then, Let's go back to our chart because we're now ready to understand why does Islam always in the end dominate? Let's look at this law of Islamic saturation. If it always happens, then it belongs in Islamic doctrine. Let's see how the doctrine of Islam dictates that saturation, that is, one day a nation once it's invaded by Islam will become 100% Muslim unless it is driven out. Here's how the doctrine causes the saturation effect from the Quran 2 193. Fight them, the Kafirs, until there is no more discord and the religion of Islam reigns absolute. But if they submit, then fight those who do wrong. Well, what does this say? The fight, the jihad, is to go on until there is no more discord and the religion of Islam reigns absolute. Well, can you see how that would drive towards saturation? Now, here's a hadith from Muslim who was one of the big collectors. Muhammad, I have been ordered to wage war against mankind until they accept there is no God but Allah and they believe I am his prophet. Well, when is the fighting to stop? After every single kafir that basically submits to Islam. Here's another hadith from Bukhari. I have been directed to fight the kafirs until every one of them admits there is only one God and that is Allah. Well, when is the fighting supposed to stop? When is the press on the Kafir supposed to stop? Only until they have submitted to Islam. So over time, the Sharia rules all. This is what I call saturation. The political doctrine demands saturation. History demonstrates saturation. And the only exception to the saturation, that is until total dominance of Islam, has been in Central Europe and the Balkans and Spain, where Islam was driven out. So. One of the differences about migration by Islam is, is that its intent is to overtake the political process of the host country. Islam cannot assimilate. Islam must dominate. Now, this is a doctrine. Let's examine it. Islam cannot truly assimilate because the Quran divides humanity into Muslim and Kafir. This is the great unusual nature of the Quran as a religious document is there is no humanity as a whole. There's only the Kafir, whom Allah hates and encourages jihad against. And then we have the Muslim. So there is no unified vision of humanity within Islam.
It's a tension of jihad that are remained between the Kafir and the Muslim until the Kafir is destroyed. Now then, here's the part about Islam that I dislike the most. There are 12 verses in the Quran which state that a Muslim is never the true friend of a Kafir. Now think about that. If you have an immigrant wave coming to your country and the principle is, is that the doctrine says they're never your true friend, now they can be friendly. And I hope you do understand the difference between friendly and friend. I recently bought a used car. When I stepped onto the car lot, I met a lot of very friendly people, but they were salesmen. They were being friendly because that's the best way to do business, but they're not my friend. Let's get over that. Now let's look further about this lack of simulation. Quran 3:28. Believers should not take Kafirs as friends in preference to other believers. In other words, a Muslim can be friendly with a Kafir, but when it comes down to the doing of favors and being a true friend, they're the true friend of the Muslim, not the Kafir. Here we have another Hadith from Dawood. Whoever collegiates or aggregates with the Kafirs and lives with them, he is one of them. Well, does this help in assimilation or does it go against assimilation? Well, it goes against assimilation, of course. Now, let's talk about the Kafir, because the Kafir is of overwhelming importance in Islam. We see here a bar chart which lays out how much of a textual doctrine is devoted to the Kafir. And what do we see? The most of the Quran, over half of it, is written about the Kafir. Nearly 81% of it in the Sirah is about the Kafir giving us a total of the Hadith, the Quran, and the Sirah, the trilogy, of over 51% is devoted to the Kafir. Now this is very unusual, a quote, religious document that's concerned with others. But I say that the Quran is not primarily a religious document. I'm now going to define another term, political Islam. It's the doctrine that deals with the Kafir. Remember this, Islam is more about politics than religion. A little sidebar here. Well, if it's about politics, why is it that we're never supposed to discuss it? Why is it Islam the only political system in which you have to be a member of before your criticism or comments are considered valid? Because that's what happens with people such as myself. I'm told, well, you're not a Muslim, so you shouldn't talk about Islam. Hello? The Islamic doctrine is about me. You mean to tell me that I should not talk about something which is about myself? So political Islam is the important part of Islam to talk about, and it's the important part of migration. Now here's another reason for lack of assimilation. There is no golden rule in Islam. Now Muslims will tell you there's a golden rule, but if they do ask them to show it to you. Instead, we find that a Muslim is a brother to another Muslim, and after all, if you can't be your friend, then how much of a golden rule is there? Now there's another way we can see the lack of a golden rule in Islam, and that is in Muhammad's career. He attacked every neighbor that he had and did so without provocation. Now, one of the ways to say that the, the golden rule is be a good neighbor. Well, if you were Muhammad's neighbor, he was going to attack you. This is just further proof about the fact that there is no golden rule in Islam. Humanity is viewed as kafir and believer. Then we have Sharia. The kafir is subjugated under the Sharia. Under the Sharia, a kafir cannot testify against a Muslim in court. A Muslim is supposed to rule over the Dhimmi, D-H-I-M-M-I. -M -M the Dhimmi is a Kafir who has agreed to live under the Sharia. So he won't be a citizen, he will be a subject. The Dhimmi status is what wears down a society once Sharia is in place. Because imagine that you're a member of some nation and you can't testify in court. If your wife is raped, she can't call the police. You can't wear, carry a weapon, you can only carry a knife. You can't even ride a horse, you have to ride a donkey. You have to wear special clothing. Your church, if you go to it, can't ring its bell so it can be heard. If the church needs a roof, you have to go to the Muslims to ask permission to do that. And your church cannot be higher than a mosque around it. So these are all rules of subjugation. But the worst part about being a demi is that the Quran says the demi is to be humiliated. So, Islam does not assimilate because it has a doctrine of non-assimilation. It has different ethics. The Kafirs are hated. Every Muslim has two natures, so you never really know who you're dealing with. Most Muslims are quite nice, 
but there is the doctrine of jihad that lurks within the corner of their heart. And Islam must dominate. As a matter of fact, what we find is, is that the word Islam means subjugation, means domination. So therefore, Muslims come to a country in the process of migration with the ultimate goal of dominating it. The purpose of migration. Well, the Quran tells us what the purpose of migration is. Quran 874. Those believers who migrated and made jihad in the cause of Allah and those who gave them asylum and help, they were the true believers. That is, those who migrated and made jihad are the real Muslims. They shall have forgiveness and honorable provisions. So the purpose of migration is to bring about the rule of the Sharia through jihad. Now let's look at migration in the Hadith. Migration cannot be ended as long as there is kufr, that is unbelief, or there are Muslims, or as long as there's an enemy who resists. Well, migration is not to be ended as long as there are kafirs. So the Muslims are to migrate to kafir countries and there begin the process of non-assimilation and domination. Sharia civilization. Migration establishes Sharia. Migration starts and establishes jihad. Now let's talk just a moment about the Sharia. The Sharia is based upon the Quran, the Sirah, and the Hadith. The Sharia is a manual for the Islamic civilization. Here's what the Sharia is. If you want to learn about how a Muslim should be married or divorced, you can look through the Quran, the Sirah, and the Hadith, but you're going to have to be digging information out of all three. Well, the Sharia codifies all the information about such things as wills, marriage, divorce, and other things as such as how to pray. So the Sharia is built upon the Quran, the Sirah, and the Hadith. So Islamic migration, all of society must become Islamic. There is no assimilation or limited assimilation. And dualism means you can't have trust. If a man has two possible ways to interact with you, one which we would call virtuous and the other we call harmful, and they're both within his doctrine, how do you ever fully trust a man? Because he does not have integrity. Kafirs can be deceived. Well, how do you trust a man who can deceive you? And deception is an honorable part of Islam. So Hijra, Islamic migration, is based on jihad and the Sharia. Now let's deal with something. Everyone who's watching this video is known Muslims, and they're not ISIS, Al-Qaeda, jihadist. Or, do you understand jihad? Well, you don't understand jihad in all probability. There's jihad of the sword, that's Al-Qaeda, Boko Haram, and, Al and Islamic State. Then we have the jihad of the pen, writing, jihad of speech, and jihad of money. Well, those can be used forms of jihad. Writing a letter to the editor denying that a person such as myself knows anything about Islam can be a form of jihad. Jihad does not mean holy war. It means effort. So a Muslim can make an effort by giving money. And indeed, a Muslim's support of a jihadist, according to the Quran, is the same as if he were a jihadist. Muslims are quite generous, by the way, in giving to forms of jihad such as lawfare, su suing people such as me in order to keep us quiet or to make us spend our money in defense of false charges which will then be dropped before the trial. That's called lawfare. So jihad is not just with a sword. As a matter of fact, jihad of the sword is the least important part of jihad. Let's see how we're implementing Sharia in our world of America today. Well, here in Tennessee, our textbooks for the seventh graders are submitting to the will of Islam. They now portray Islam as the great civilization of humanity. Islam was the first to give women their rights. Islam was the most tolerant of religions because it provides a place for the Christian and the Jew. But the place of the religion for the Christian and the Jew is they are to be demis, to be subjugated. So the textbooks at best tell us a half-truth, which is very favorable towards Islam. Then we have something, we see the Sharia being implemented in terms of interfaith dialogues. Now interfaith dialogues sounds like a great idea, and if they're done right, I would be all for them. But here's how the interfaith dialogue works. Here's an example from the early days. There was the first interfaith dialogue here in Tennessee, and went, and we, in those days you could ask questions from the floor. Now then they make you write them down on pieces of paper, so they can pick and choose amongst the questions. They were not made comfortable by some of our questions. 
So ask the rabbi, have you read the Quran? No. Ask the Baptist minister, have you read the Quran? No. Ask the imam, have you read the New Testament? Oh yes, I've had several courses in it. Have you read the Old Testament? Oh yes, I know it well. Now then, what's going to happen to this interfaith dialogue? Well, the Christian and the Jew are going to apologize for other Christians and other Jews, such as myself, who've spoken against Islam. That is, they're going to be deferential to Islam. They're not going to ever ask difficult questions. So this is the problem of the interfaith dialogue. The Christians and the Jews who show up are complete apologists for Islam. Then we have the media. Well, in the media, I'm a bigot, a hater, and a racist. So this is the media's view of anyone who talks about Islam and not in a purely Islamophilic way. I use the term friend of Islam instead of Islamophobic. So the media has a very definite bias. When I go to Europe, it's very different with me and the media. I'm, they do an interview with me in the magazine, and you know what they do? They simply publish what I say. Whereas in America, they write what a bad person I am. Also, when I'm in Europe, I can be on state television for extensive interviews. Not so in America. Then we come to me what is the, one of the saddest ways of Sharia, and that is in our universities. I recently was going to speak in North Carolina, and the president of a local community college said that I was unbalanced and that I should never be allowed to speak. You know, this is tragic. Let's say that I represent a political point of view that you don't like. Wouldn't it be better to have a debate than to say, no, no, shut him up? Because you see, the next step is going to be they will sue people like me for my house and my home. Then the next step after that is people such as myself will be criminalized. So the universities no longer provide a forum of debate. The universities have become nothing more than ideological centers, which is tragic because the cornerstone of our intellectual life used to be critical thought, scientific thought, but no more. Nope, the university's purpose there is to present ideology. Let me give you one more story about a university which happened here in Nashville, Tennessee, at Vanderbilt. A woman who is a tenured professor has said, this is not politically correct, but this is what I believe, and she spoke on some subject. The horror of it, the politically incorrect professor was put on the front page of the newspaper and criticized as being a hater and a bigot. But here's the real tragedy. <laughs> the university established an, an emotional hotline. If you were a student in her class and you were traumatized by hearing a political idea that you do not agree with, Vanderbilt University would set up a hotline so that you could talk about your trauma because you had heard an idea that you didn't agree with and you're traumatized. So that is what a Sharia is like in America today. Now the Sharia has not caused the complete collapse of ideological debate in our universities, but it has become part of it. What are we going to do about this? We have to know Islam. We have to learn how to use fact-based reasoning. Listen to this lecture which you've been hearing now. Fact, 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 fact. I do not talk about opinions, I talk about facts. We also need to know the history of the persecution. In that dynamic battle map, listen, people were dying, Christians were dying, Zoroastrians were dying, Buddhists were dying, Hindus are dying. We need to know the history of the destruction of the Kafir. Why? Because unless we know this history, it will be repeated. Churches need to know that in the 20th century, Christians died in the order of a couple of million Armenians and Assyrian Christians. Why don't churches study the history of their own persecution? And we also have to be able to talk. By talk, I mean we need to be able to debate and reason. And we have to say no to political correctness. Political correctness is the cancer of critical thought. We're bringing all manner of refugees to America. Why not Christian refugees? And why don't the churches stand up for Christian refugees? Surely they know they need to. And we have to learn how to talk to the near enemy, the apologist. When we see this expansion of power in America today, it is not so much by the Muslims as it is by corporations who enforce Sharia laws about this or that, as well as politically correct ideas. So we need to start talking to those who oppress us, that is, the media. We need to talk to them. Why is it you only present one side of the Islamic equation? We need to educate ourselves. And we have to face the truth of the roots of civilization and it's how it affected by migration. 
And we need to understand that by bringing in more and more Islam, we're bringing in more and more Sharia. Think about this. Do we want the schools of the future to teach nothing but Islamic side of all questions? If we do not stop and learn about it and insist that all sides of the question be portrayed, that's what happened. We will fall under the rule of the law of Islamic saturation. If you want that, be quiet. If you don't want it, educate and start talking to your friends and neighbors. Thank you.